In this video, as a celebration that Silk Song has finally released after 7 years, I'm going to make a 3D model based on this artwork, and as always, I'm going to do my best to make it look exactly like the original image. I start most of my projects the exact same way. First, I match the camera resolution to the resolution of the reference image so that I can bring the artwork directly into the viewport. After that, I drag in my adjustable mannequin. There's a link in the description if you want to check it out. From here, I use the sliders to get the rough form of the character. I always start by lining up the torso first, because the arms and legs can be stretched to fit later. If the torso isn't correct, the whole pose becomes much harder to match. When posing, you always have to focus on the weight of the character and where the center of gravity is. You want the pose to match, but you don't want the character to be leaning so far forward that they would fall over, so it's a balancing act. At this stage, I don't commit to anything too soon. As I add the other pieces like the sword, the head and the cape, the model slowly becomes more stable. Everything has to match the image, but it also has to make sense in 3D, so it's a process of gradually putting all the pieces into place. If you're ever modeling a cape, there are really two main ways to approach it. You can model it traditionally, maybe sculpt in some folds with the cloth brushes, or you can have some fun and use a physics simulation. To do that, set the body to collision, set the cape to cloth, and when you press play, the fabric will fall naturally onto the character. If it looks too blocky, just add more subdivisions to the cape for extra detail. You'll also want to tweak the thickness and collision distance, otherwise the cape will look like it's hovering slightly off the body. But now, we can fully utilize Blender's physics simulations. You've probably never seen these options before, but when we open the Add menu, way down at the bottom, we can add force fields, so we can add a wind force field to the scene to add wind that will blow the cape. Now if we press play, nothing happens. For some reason, by default, the wind strength and flow settings are way too low. Try turning them up to two or 3,000 and see if it does anything. Now if we press play, we should see the wind pushing the cloth. From here, you can combine different force fields, animate the character, or just apply the simulation and sculpt in extra details to refine the shape. This is just a quick overview. You can go and watch a dedicated physics simulation video if you want to learn more about Blender's physics simulations. Once the cape is in place, I can start focusing on matching the proportions more accurately. The adjustable mannequin gets me pretty close, but that last 10% always needs some manual tweaking. You'll see these blue lines all over the model, and these are annotation lines so that I can see where the shapes need to be. You can draw annotations by holding D and left-clicking. This way, I don't need to constantly rely on seeing the reference image through the character. All I have to do is line up the model to those annotation lines. By slowly adjusting everything piece by piece, the rough mannequin turns into a model that matches the reference. To create the thread, I used a curve. Curves in Blender are a special type of object where you place and adjust points, and Blender generates a smooth curved shape between them. The main thing I focus on is making sure the curve looks good from every angle. From the front, I can line it up perfectly with the reference, but if I only do that, then from the side, it'll just look flat. So instead, I give the curve its own depth and shape, checking it from different angles. Sometimes you'll notice kinks or bends that only show up at certain angles, even if it looks perfect from the front. It's another balancing act, getting it to match the artwork, but also making it feel natural and three-dimensional. Let's start wrapping things up with the sword. There are a bunch of different ways to add outlines, and I have a dedicated line art video if you want to see different methods, but for this one I'm using the inverted hull technique. The basic concept is that we expand our mesh, then give it a black material. Then we can invert this expanded mesh and give it a special material, so that instead of blocking the main mesh, it will show up behind it. In this case, it also creates a line across the circular part of the sword, which doesn't match the reference, so we need to remove it. In the Solidify modifier, we can use a vertex group to control which parts of the mesh get the outlines. So by weight painting different parts of the sword, we can remove the outlines from those areas. We can smooth it out to make the transitions a bit smoother, but now we don't have any more lines where we don't want them. And as an added bonus, we can now make the lines a bit more dynamic by painting all over the model, and this will change the thickness of the outline. If you want a more step-by-step -step version of this, I also have a dynamic outline video that you can check out. Now it's time to retopologize the body. For those that don't know, retopology is the process of optimizing a mesh to clean up the flow and structure of it. An unoptimized mesh can be very intensive for your PC, so by cleaning it up, we can make our lives a lot easier at later stages. But for me, the big advantage here is that I can define exactly where I want grease pencil lines to appear. I know that I want to have a few lines on the body of the character, like around the knees, crotch, and chest. And these lines are pretty much impossible for the inverted hull technique to create, so we can manually define some of these edges as grease pencil lines. In edit mode, I just select the edges I want, press Ctrl E, and mark them as freestyle edges. Then, by adding a grease pencil object and setting it to only draw edge marks, Blender will only draw the lines that we've defined. 
If you're using the solidify modifier for your outlines, these edge marks will actually be drawn twice, so to remove them, we can use some more weight painting to remove the outlines in these areas. Unlike the sword, we can also have some fun by creating dynamic outlines on the body of the character. The hand was actually one of the hardest parts of this whole model. The artwork suggests a hand-like shape, but when you really break it down, it just doesn't make sense in 3D. I was toying with the idea of using real fingers to try and mimic the shape, but the outlines never looked right. In the end, the simplest solution was to build a kind of weird, blocky hand shape from scratch. It doesn't really resemble a hand, but it matches the artwork, and that's all that matters. After finalizing the head shape, the next step is to make the eyes, and there are a few different ways you could approach this. They could be cutouts, almost like a skull where the sockets have depth. They could be protruding shapes that stick out from the head like an insect. But for this model, I decided to keep it simple and use a flat mesh that sits directly on the surface. Now you might expect to use the shrink wrap modifier here to project the mesh onto the head, but there's actually an easier method. If you enable snapping at the top of the viewport, set it to face project, you can then select the eye mesh and simply click. All the vertices will snap directly to the head without needing any modifiers. From here we can just inflate this mesh slightly with Alt S to push it outside the head, and now the eyes match the head shape perfectly. After finalizing the cape, the next step is to give it a material. If we look at the original artwork, the inside of the cape has a darker red, and in some areas it's even completely black. We can replicate that in Blender using the back face data. To oversimplify, every model has a front face and a back face. You can see this clearly if you turn on the face orientation overlay. Blue means you're looking at the front face, red means the back. Since we can see both the front and back of the cape at the same time, we can use this to drive different colors. In the shader editor, the geometry node has a back facing output, which gives us a simple black and white mask for the inside and outside of the cape. If we plug this into the factor of a mixed color node, we can make a darker shade on the inside of the cape. However, for my use case, this method won't work because I want an outline on the cape, and outlines don't really work on a single sided surface. To fix that, I need to add two solidify modifiers. The first adds thickness, and the second generates the outline. Now I just need to manually select the faces of this new mesh and assign the colors directly instead of doing them through the material. Unfortunately, it's just a trade-off. I wanted the outlines around the cape, so to do that, the cape model had to get a little bit more complicated, but the end result is worth it. As a bit of fun, I wanted the speech bubbles to always point at the characters as the model rotates. This was a bit tricky to figure out, but my solution was to recreate the speech bubbles with some circles, making sure to offset the black portion. Then when we create the arrow portion, this arrow can sit between the black and white areas, and as we move the arrow, it will still look like it's connected to the bubble. Now we can add a damped track constraint to the arrow, and as we move it, it will always point at the character. The arrow is a little bit crooked, so I can add a limit rotation constraint, and this will limit the rotation to only the y-axis. Then we can parent the arrow to the main portion of the speech bubble, but now the arrow is rotating around its own origin point instead of the bubble center, so we need to move the origin so that it rotates around the bubble, not around itself. Under the options menu in the top right corner of the viewport, you can enable effect only origins. With that on, we can move the gizmo to the center of the bubble to move the origin point. Make sure to uncheck the option again, and now the arrow rotates exactly how it should. The last step is making the bubbles face the camera at all times. For that, I added a copy rotation constraint to the bubble and targeted the camera. Now, no matter how the scene rotates, the speech bubbles always face the characters and the viewer at the same time. And with that, the model is complete. This one was deceptively tricky. At first glance, it looks like you could just throw a flat material on and be done, but getting all of the outlines to behave properly took a bit of extra work. Still, it wasn't too bad overall. The whole thing came together in about 7 hours. If you want to have a look at the model up close and personal, I've uploaded it to Sketchfab so you can have a look at it for yourselves. That's it for this one. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.